Devil out. Now we're serious. Scott. Here. Waters. <clears throat> Here. Moore. Here. O'Kane. Here. Shaner. Here. We stand for a moment of silent prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chris, is on ball? Oh, okay. Okay. How are you today? Reads, whereas the Salvation Army exists to meet human and human needs where, wherever, whenever, and however they can, the Salvation Army assists approximately 23 million individuals annually in 130 countries worldwide. Whereas the Salvation Army does this by providing emergency food, pantry assistance, rent and utility assistance, youth programs, adult programs, free produce days, disaster services. The Pathway of Hope program, Coach for Kids, School Supply Drives, and Famous Red Kettles, and much more. And whereas the holiday season, the Salvation Army of Siouxland expects to see a greater need for services, but we know our community will love beyond and help our neighbors in need. Now, therefore, I, Robert E. Scott, on behalf of City Council, do hereby proclaim November 11, 2022 to December 24, 2022, as Salvation Army Red Cattle <coughs> Days in Sioux City, Iowa, and urge all citizens to actively volunteer and donate this holiday season. I'd like to present this to you. you. Go ahead and say a few words. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, we just want to say thank you already. So we started on Friday, as you know, and I just did a little post that we're at 2% of our goal, which seems very small, but in the grand scheme of things, that is wonderful for the first two days. So thank you to Sioux City for stepping up already and for donating to the Salvation Army. We are seeing a greater need this year with everything going on in our world. And so we appreciate you all helping us to meet the needs in Siouxland. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Wilson here. There you are, Kim. I couldn't see you. Whereas hospice professionals and volunteers provide patients, families, the highest quality of care during life-limiting illnesses through pain management and symptom control, allowing patients to live fully until the final moment, surrounded and supported by the faces of loved ones, friends, and committed caregivers. And whereas professional and compassionate staff, including physicians, nurses, social workers, Health aides, chaplains, bereavement coordinators, and volunteers provide comprehensive care focused on the wishes of each individual patient, and whereas last year more than 1.6 million patients living with life-limiting illnesses and their families received hospice, and an additional 6 million would benefit from palliative care in communities throughout the United States. Whereas Hospice of Siouxland is also recognized nationally at the highest po level possible for care provided to veterans and their loved ones. Now, therefore, I, Robert E. Scott, Mayor of the City of Sioux City, I, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim November 2022 as National Hospice and Palliative, Palliative Care Month in Sioux City and urge the citizens to join with me and others nationwide to express encouragement and appreciation for the services performed by their caregivers. I'd like to present that to you and say a few Thank words. you so much. Well, on behalf of Hospice of Siouxland, Siouxland Palliative Care, thank you all so much for your support of our organization. Uh, we are Siouxland's only locally owned nonprofit. We are co-owned by Mercy One Medical Center and Unity Point Health St. Luke's, uh, although we operate financially independent from them, so we are so excited. We serve about 500 patients every year um, in hospice care, and I believe we had about 162 on our palliative care census this morning. Um, so we are so grateful to be able to help not only um, our patients, but to be able to help our caregivers with all of the um, disciplines that we have. We now have three medical doctors along with two advanced registered nurse practitioners and all of the other disciplines. So thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, just let me start by saying how awkward it is to be standing here speaking to you, um, <laughs> two feet away from me, but uh, it is a pleasure. It's this good to see you again. To do is I'm gonna be nice. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, we're here today to, to mark the successful completion of a project in partnership with the city with the uh, relighting project of the, of the Discovery uh, parking ramp. Uh, it's about a $300,000 project. Um, you know, uh, you know, we have to we have to acknowledge the work that uh, Tiffany and and her team did uh, to engage us early, engage us often, and uh, be able to uh, really pull together a very nice rebate uh, for all of the uh, new energy efficient uh, lighting systems in the Discovery Ramp. So, on a three hundred thousand dollar project, that equated to just over one hundred and five thousand dollars in rebates back to the city. So, that is why we are here is to present you. The actual real live check. Uh, my you know, I, I really I, I wanted to do the big lottery check, but no, no, you know, we'll, just take one we do. we'll take the small one that Mr. matters more. Thank All you. right, thank you, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for it was a seamless process. So I just I appreciate everything you guys did to make the process extremely simple for the city. Yeah, you, guys, you made it really easy to work with. So. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll do an interview for Inclusive Sioux City Advisory Committee, Risty Price. Risty, come uh, come to that one. Can you get? I can go to the one that's just banging. Okay, whatever works for you. Whatever. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve. Um. Okay. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Sioux City. I do live in Ottawa, Iowa now, just 30 miles south. My mother was on the handicap committee back in the 80s, so she was a part of that in making changes. Uh, I play in local bands. I work in a high school with kids, uh, open book. So, so what else Perfect. do we need? <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you tell us about some of your experience um, serving the Siouxland community? Um, serving the Siouxland community, uh, working with kids in high school, working in churches, uh, uh, playing in bands, going to venues. Uh, I'm not too sure exactly what else. I mean, as I far as uh, told him that before, most of my coach. <laughs> so. I just want to be a part of this so I can help change things for the disabled community. So many places that aren't accessible, that could be accessible, or just things like that, you know, make small changes. And when I was searching to find a way to help, uh, I stumbled across this. Someone gave me Samar's number, I reached out, and she said there was an opening on an advisory committee that's volunteer-based. I thought that was perfect, right up my alley. So, the, uh, the problem is that we'll have to address it, but it now only calls for Sioux City residents yep. on this committee. So we'll have to discuss that and see if we're willing to open that up. Yep, okay. I saw that, and they said you guys would have the power to overturn that if you wanted. But okay. yeah, it's been an ongoing discussion and a difficult situation that we've had. So. We'll definitely have to discuss it and cool. appreciate your application. I know we um, exchanged emails and stuff yep. a couple times, and so I apologize and no. get circled back, but I'm glad to see you here. Yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, Thanks for applying. Have a good day. Yep. Presentations on Downtown Partners quarterly updates. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Reagan Cody, Executive Director of Downtown Partners. Here with Carly Howery, who's our business development coordinator. I believe Heidi has our presentation, or I can click here if I need to. Yep, if you bring it up. We'll get to it here. 
All right, thank you. The beautiful lights. We won't spend too much time on those. They are here. We gave you an update um, last June was our last time we, we updated you in council. So bear with us. We'll make this fairly quick since thank you for putting us at the beginning of the meeting today. Uh, this is our board of directors. Since the last time we met with you, um, every year we do rotate about a third of our board. And this year's president is Alexia Boggs with Ho-Chunk Capital. Our vice president is Kaylee Ta Katie Towler. She's with the Sioux City Schools Career Academy. And Kaylee Betterton is now our treasurer with Heritage Bank. And you can see the list of council, or we, they'll want to be council members someday, I'm sure, um, our board members there. The first thing I want to touch on that we'll get obviously more in depth to over the next couple months as we have our, our five-year renewal with downtown partners. Again, this happens every five years. What we're asked to do is go out to our property owners. There are 527 of them in downtown. And we ask that they sign a petition to either support or not support downtown partners for the next five years. Right now, we have submitted our uh, paperwork with the city and pleased to say that the progress has not only been uh, swift, thanks to our property owners, but has been very positive. Uh, we've had one property owner that is not signing. There are some with no response yet. We've had not just trouble reaching, but may not have gotten back to us right now. Um, and then we have uh, right now ownership and assessment value are the two things that we need at least 25% on to follow through. So right now we are at 78% of ownership supportive and 88% percent of the value supportive so we feel that's a great thing for downtown it means we're obviously doing something right and our property owners are agreeing with that and and doing something as well so very positive right now in downtown um, just to highlight a couple of things that we'll be working on uh, the first is I mentioned last time we were taking some of the studies that have been done on downtown for our pedestrians and our cyclists uh, the pictures you see there are usually what you see from a study. Some people don't read those as well as just having a visual of what it's going to look like in downtown. So what we did is we took a couple spots um, that we wanted to focus in on and get those done with renderings. And renderings are basically what that visually would look like in downtown in the future. Uh, we are focusing on the riverfront connections and the core of downtown. One extra area we added to the study was 3rd and Jackson. That's been a high pedestrian vehicular kind of area access that's had some trouble, so we did add that to the study at the end. Just to give you a couple highlights, we are not done yet. There's a lot of conversations to have, but just wanted to give you some of the pretty pictures, I guess, to help explain what this is. Uh, the first up there on the left is what they call basically a, a pedestrian or a biking uh, railway here that goes from Pierce Street and it connects the riverfront to the trail system that is just north of the chamber. That puts a little bit of a spin on a larger kind of area for the bikes and for the pedestrians. And then the bottom is the Virginia Street corridor. This one they would recommend on both, not putting pedestrians or bikes with traffic, but actually getting them off onto their own path. The next is a future view of 6th Street. Now this could be replicated on any of our three-way, our three-lane areas in downtown. This was focused on because of the access coming down, we see a lot of faster traffic moving down 6th Street from the hospital since it is an angle and on a hill. Uh, so looking at this as more of a pedestrian friendlier area. Um, obviously the skywalk is a future view, but this again is for the future. Taking three lanes down to two and adding that bike lane, um, the dashed area there would be for valet to go in and out. Uh, but really starting to take a look at what this could all look like in downtown is what we're focusing on. And with that, I'll hand it over to Carly. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Carly. I'm the Business Development Coordinator for Downtown Partners. And what you have before you <coughs> is our graph of engagement from January of 2022 until October of 2022, which is when I pulled these numbers. Engagement, if you need a quick refresher, is anytime someone interacts with a post besides just seeing it on the feed. So if they like it, share it, retweet it, all that good stuff, it shows up on this graph here. And you can see that it ebbs and flows throughout the year, but we have um, seen a significant increase of engagement, which is very exciting as we have the holidays coming up and all the fun things that come with it. And then below are numbers um, in comparison to the same time period of last year. So as you can see, it's all in the green. It's all great to see the engagement um, increase throughout the years. Speaking of holidays and fun things coming up, we have a plenty. So um, if you haven't heard, Downtown for the Holidays is next Monday, November 21st. We have Small Business Bingo kicking off on the 26th. The 12 Days of Giveaway will be a social media exclusive from December 1 through 12th, as well as a holiday storefront decorating competition and Small Business Marketplace for holiday-focused events, as well as the Sioux City Musketeers, the Clark Cup Champs kicking off their season. 
um, NAI Volleyball returning, and Broadway at the Orpheum as well. Oh, okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be my slide. This is where we'll leave you. Uh, just basically a reminder to everyone, not only in our community, but in downtown businesses, that we do have support available in a couple different forms, one of which is through our storefront grant. We've uh, serviced over, I'd say, what were we at, 182,000 worth of um, improvements in downtown thanks to this grant. So it's a $2,500 matching grant, 50-50 match, uh, that can be used for signage, windows, doors, anything on the betterment of the facade of the building. The other one is a new release. It's a 50% rent relief for six months. We work with the property owners to give a new business into downtown 50% off of their rent for the first six months. That's had um, a lot of interest. We've had two that have signed so far and it's only been open for two months and then three in the hopper. So we do have some new businesses. Looking forward to them coming downtown. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Hope the good work. No doubt. Have you had, have you had a good response to the rent relief? Yeah, we've had, well, we've had a lot of calls. I'd say at least 30 some calls on it. Uh, everybody's at a different stage of development when it comes to a new business, but we've had two sign on that were really working on leases before this kind of showed up. So it was anything after July 29th. And then we've got three in the hopper right now that the committee will be reviewing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks ladies. Health advisory levels for PFAS <coughs> compounds. Not as riveting as downtown development, but Brad, here we go, bud. <laughs> I'll give it a whirl. A little less time hunting, a little more in the water plant, we might not be having these problems. <laughs> <laughs> might have before he was born. Yeah, no must kidding. Have quit, must have quit posting pictures. I didn't see I any this weekend. I was there. I just took a week off. I didn't want to take any grief from you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Brad Pitts, Utilities Director. Uh, here today to talk about uh, an emerging contaminant in PFAS. As you're well aware, uh, back in December of 21, um, the Air Base, the 185th Air National Guard, did some testing on base, and then from there they furthered their testing out into <coughs> additional well sites, which included the uh, Southbridge Collector Well. Uh, in January of 2022, we started to test for PFAS on our own, and ultimately we started uh, in on a program with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and we are now testing quarterly uh, for PFAS in the drinking water. So a little short history uh, before we get going with the presentation. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So we'll start off with uh, what is PFAS? PFAS are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They are a class of man-made compounds made up of more than 6,000 individual chemicals. Uh, they've been in use since the 1940s. They were developed in the 60s by the US Navy uh, for use in uh, firefighting foams, which we'll talk a little bit more about as we go. Uh, they're characterized by long chains of linked carbon and fluorine atoms. There is a number of uses for PFAS, both residential and commercial. Uh, we talk about nonstick coatings, Teflon being the most common one, uh, fast food packaging. There is PFAS in your uh, burger wrappers. There's PFAS in your microwave popcorn packages. There's PFAS in your uh, pizza boxes. So. It's just, uh, there's a number of items. We talk about stain resistant, uh, most notably Scotch Guard uh, is made of PFAS, and then water resistant clothing such as Gore-Tex. And then the, the reason that we're here and the reason that we believe um, Sioux City has PFAS in its water at this point in time are from aqueous firefighting foams. Those are the foams that are used uh, for fighting fires on on air bases, uh, notably the 185th. Uh, those concentrations on the base were extremely high. What we found are the, the foams have entered the groundwater and they've migrated off site to the Southbridge Collector Well. With everything, PFAS has a cycle. Uh, one of the things I should have noted on the previous page is that these are called forever chemicals because they're very, very difficult to get rid of. They do not decay in the environment. 
and they basically stick around forever. There's very few ways to actually dispose of PFAS. Uh, with this cycle, what we look at is production. Uh, we look at wastewater plant residuals. Uh, we look at food production. Uh, all, all paths, just as everything, lead to groundwater. And uh, that's the situation that we're in today. Back in January, and even in December, and before that, back in 2013, uh, when we went through UCMR3, Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, PFAS was tested for. Uh, up until June of this year, the health advisory level for PFAS was 70, and that was PFAS and PFOA combined together. The results before that, uh, Sioux City's results were 9.1 for PFAS and PFOA combined, when the health, health advisory level was 70. In June of 20, or I'm sorry, in June 15th of 2022, EPA came out with some interim health advisory levels, uh, which basically stunned the, the water community uh, because they were lowered by nearly 12,500 times. Uh, and they went from 70 to 0.004 parts per trillion for PFOS and 0 0.020 for PFOA. Um, it's very difficult to surmise why EPA took such a drastic move in lowering the levels. I think they're trying to make a statement about PFAS, they want it taken care of, and uh, water utilities, obviously, uh, number one line of health defense, you know, pass, we're, uh, we're receiving PFAS in the groundwater and we're passing it on to our citizens, and uh, it's gonna be up to us to take care of it. It is important to know that these are health advisories, they are not maximum contaminant levels, these, these are not regulatory levels. Uh, so Sioux City is not in violation, and while we have exceeded the health advisory level, uh, the reason we're here today is because we're required to do public messaging by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. We want to be very transparent in what we're doing uh, and what we know at this time about PFAS in the drinking water. You can see the latest results, sorry, um, since March through October, the PFAS levels uh, that we have tested for, the results, 4.4 parts per trillion of PFOS and 5.7 parts per trillion of PFOA. There are two other chemicals noted on there. These are final uh, published rules for these two chemicals known as, uh, well, the HFPO is a Gen X chemical. And as you can see, Sioux City has not tested even close to either of those for health advisory levels. Testing capabilities, one of the other struggles that water utilities are going through right now is uh, the health advisory levels set by EPA are not attainable in a lab setting. Right now, 75% of the labs that are testing for PFAS uh, can only report with 95% confidence uh, to a level of four parts per trillion. Uh, I've heard that they're able to test down to two parts per trillion, but the 0 .004 and the 0 .020 are not attainable. And that's what makes it very difficult for water utilities to understand is why they, they went so low with the interim health advisory levels. And anything before, below four parts per trillion uh, right now is essentially treated as an uncertainty and they are not required to do public messaging. As I mentioned, Sioux City is conducting quarterly monitoring and will continue to do so. Uh, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule five is coming up. Uh, P 29 PFAS compounds are included in that testing. Uh, so we will be doing additional testing for another year or two years, I can't recall how long that, that program goes. What have we learned? Uh, there's a number of items on this page. There's roughly a dozen utilities in the state of Iowa that are dealing with the same thing we are. There's thousands of water utilities around the nation 
and many, more, many, many more around the globe uh, that are dealing with PFAS in drinking water and the challenges that they're, that they're facing to get rid of it. Um, there's very few options uh, to treat PFAS um, and it's gonna be diffi a difficult one at that. Utilities are leaning on the EPA. The more they learn, the more we will know. The more we know, uh, we will update as much as we can. But it's, you know, it's, it's interim and it's very difficult to pass on information that we don't know at this time. <clears throat> so EPA's researchers and partners across the country are working hard to answer critical questions about PFAS, how to better more efficiently detect and measure PFAS, which we just discussed in water, soil, in air, fish, and wildlife, uh, how much people are exposed to PFAS, how harmful is PFAS, and that's the question. At what, at what level in water is PFAS harmful? And we just don't know that information at this point in time. And how to manage and dispose of PFAS, and that's a critical point as we talk about uh, removing it from drinking water. One of the questions I know we'll get is it pertains to bottled water. Uh, EPA at this time is not recommending bottled water for communities based solely on PFAS results uh, that exceed the health advisory levels. Um, the Iowa, or I'm sorry, the International Bottled, bottled Water Association <coughs> has set standards of quality that are higher than the health advisory levels that EPA has set. This may have changed a little bit since uh, this information came about, but the, uh, once again, we discussed bottled water, nothing against those folks, but their, their standards are just not what uh, municipal water utilities are. Public messaging. Sioux City is, com is uh, committed to transparency regarding PFAS in the drinking water. We want the citizens to know everything that we know. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. Public messaging is required. As I mentioned, we're doing that tonight. The due date was by November 18th. Uh, Sioux City has, will provide the citizens with required health language from the Department of Natural Resources that is on the website. Um, and the website is listed below here. And we'll have more information on that uh, out in the news. So is Sioux City's water safe to drink? Uh, the short answer is that it's just as safe as it was a month ago, a year ago, or 10 years ago. The only thing that the PFAS levels in the water have not changed. What has changed is the health advisory level set by the US EPA. And we're trying to manage that as well as we can until we gather more information. So where are we at today? Uh, the interim rule is supposed to be out by the end of December. The final rule is supposed to be published by the end of 2023 with enforcement uh, by the fall of 2026. Uh, Sioux City does not want to, or we do not want to get uh, ahead of ourselves in determining what Sioux City wants to do until the final rule comes out. There is a chance that the health advisory levels will increase from the interim levels, uh, and there is a possibility that Sioux City may not have to do anything and there's a possibility that we may have to do something. So in the meantime, uh, we don't wanna be premature in, in doing a whole bunch of items that are not gonna prove beneficial once the final rule is published. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm free to answer any. Brad, I've got, I have a couple, if I may. Yep. Um, when you say the PFAS is at 4.4 per parts or per parts per trillion, and the EPA health advisory is 0 0.020, and I appreciate in your presentation you talked about and hit head on is Sioux City water safe to drink due to PFAS? What I'm going to take it higher. What what part per trillion would you have to get to before there would be a a real con? I mean a I don't want to say a real concern. You're, you've, you're saying we have a concern today, but we're dealing with it. But how high would it have to get before it would really have to start taking some action? We don't know. 
And I guess that's the an unfortunately that is the answer for now is we don't know. And we won't know until the final rule is published at the end of next year. Uh, it could, they could leave it the same. I don't think they will. Uh, they may raise the health advisory level, but it will not go back to anything close to 70 parts per trillion what it was before. Uh, so I can't uh, guess at what their final rule will be. So that's a, it's a difficult question to answer at this point. And that's true with the uh, PFOA? Yeah, both of them. Both of them. Yep. Applies to. Well, I, this has already made some of the news. And of course, everyone should be, and they're asking the question, is it safe for what we have now? Is it safe for drinking? And we're clearly saying, yes, it is. Just like you said in your presentation 10 years ago, two years ago, you know, a month ago, it's, it's the same, it, we have the same. So we don't, so, you, it's, so it's kind of a wait and see. Right. Right. We're, we've been provided uh, the health advisory language by the Department of Natural Resources. It's out there for everyone to see. Uh, that's all we can do at this point is provide the citizens the information that we know. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Brad, one comment or question that I had is I, I tend to look at trends across the state and across the community to kind of gauge where we are at. If there's something we're doing that's exceptional, if our people should be alarmed that others are experiencing something that maybe others aren't. I know we talked about it in our team meeting, but can you share just a little bit? I mean, this is a level that is experienced. I mean, that heck, they can't even test for it at the appropriate levels. So they're just kind of shooting, saying, hey, as long as there's this level, we need to at least put out a health advisory warning. We're not sure at what level it becomes less safe, but we just want the public to be informed of this. Are other communities experiencing the same situation, having to go before the council, having to make these announcements as well? Yeah, of the dozen or so communities that, that are experiencing the same issues, I think uh, to date maybe six or seven of them have done the same exact thing. I know Ames has launched a very large campaign. They did early on uh, about PFAS, uh, trying to be very transparent with, with what they're dealing with. Uh, some of the communities are not tasked with the same issue that we are. We have one source of water for the Southbridge plant. Others have multiple sources and they're able to uh, blend to, to lower their levels a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. You know, just to kind of put it into perspective, we talk about four parts per trillion. We're talking about four drops of PFAS in like a, an Olympic sized swimming pool. So it kind of puts it into perspective at the very low, low levels that we're looking at. And Sioux City was just slightly over that threshold at what the number? Yeah, they fluctuated a little bit, but the average is 4.4. .4. I think we had one that was below four at 3.9. And four is the yeah, and four, number. Yeah, and four, yeah, yep. Which I think is such an important visual, you know, that right. they're unsure what levels are unsafe. They just want us to at least educate the public and allow them to understand this. It's the same water we're testing all the time at the wastewater or at the water treatment plant, making sure that those levels are safe for consumption. But to think and try to put it in perspective, again, these parts per trillion and things can get very complicated. But yes, I mean, it's essentially four drops of water put into an Olympic sized swimming pool. Just puts it a little bit into perspective, but I appreciate your efforts to stay on top of this, educate the public, even if it seems that <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty and sometimes we're setting regulations that are tough to even test or understand. So I appreciate you keeping us up to date. And we don't have that problem and at the riverfront, only at the South Ridge. Yeah, just the South Ridge plan is part of the Department of Natural Resources testing program. Uh, they tested several wells on the riverfront and they, uh, no detects on, on any of the four that we provided above. And how much does the riverfront water supply to the community? Uh, I think I provided that number. I want to say it's right around 85 or 90 percent of the water. To that, that's my point. Yeah. The majority of this water is not even being used. Right. That should make people feel a little bit more comfortable. And this is an advisory. It's not a warning. No, no, I, I get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think what we might be up against sometimes is the newspaper articles that have uh, 
published stories on communities outside of the state of Iowa, the, the poorer communities that are really, really, I mean, they have a real problem with their drinking water. I mean, it's, it's serious, and, and they're trying to deal with that. So the, the smaller communities, like a community of 1,000 people. So that's hitting the news about the same time this advisory is coming out. So we just want to be real careful about what, our, what we're looking at as, as a city of Sioux City and what other communities are looking at. If, if those that read the paper um, you know, see those articles, that's, that's a whole different issue. Our, uh, our previous testing was 9.1 parts per trillion for the combined PFAS. And the, the water, they, they said if it was over 10, is that correct? Oh, over for 10 the, parts per trillion? Yeah, 10 parts per trillion. Okay. Five, five parts per trillion for one, I don't remember which is which, but five parts per trillion for one and 10 parts per trillion for, two, for both. And for both. Yeah. So my question would be that that still seems like we're, we're getting kind of up there. Is, is there any way that we can be more proactive as a city? I know we don't want to be reactionary uh, if, if something comes down the pipe. I also know that we don't want to commit to um, systems that still aren't tested or in place. One of the things that you mentioned was how difficult they are to, to be able to get rid of, right? It's impossible to break the chain. Is, is there ways that we can be more proactive in this situation, or, or would your advice be we really need to wait until we see where the cards are? Yeah, we really do need to wait. Some communities have treatment processes in place that will assist with PFAS removal. So they're beginning studies uh, to figure out how they can maximize the treatment processes to remove it. Uh, right now, Sioux City doesn't have any of those processes in place. Uh, so to put to task something of that magnitude at this point in time just doesn't make sense. Give me a ballpark number what that would be. Uh, on the low end, I would say moving uh, our collector well to a different source water, you're looking at probably four and a half million. Uh, on the high end for the treatment, whether you're talking uh, the three right now are reverse osmosis, ion exchange, or activated carbon. Um, to add those to the plan, I would say 10 million plus. That's, yeah. I was thinking you'd be better off to move Abandon the well. Oh, right, abandon the well and get a new one. Bill. Uh, William Burroughs, 4409 47th Street, Sioux City. I had a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Pitts um, based on the article that was in the Saturday's paper. <clears throat> the headline says, no cause for concern. Would you agree with that? No cause for concern. At this point in time, I think I would agree with that based on the little information we know and the little um, guidance that we've gotten from EPA. Uh, like I said, until we get a final rule published uh, at the end of next year, it's, it's an uncertainty. We just don't know. Um, they the would, let me, let me uh, preface that by saying, uh, you know, we, we were provided the health advisory language by the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, obviously, that's done for a reason. So it's out there. If anyone has concerns after they, they read the list, I don't remember what all of them are offhand, uh, but if anyone has concerns, they should certainly consult their doctor. That was my next question. How is the health department involved in this at all? No, the, the Sioux Land District, or Sioux Land District yeah. Health Department, no, they are not. They have been made should aware, they but they are not involved. I don't know what they're, I don't know what role they would play at this point in time. Yeah. Uh, they don't have the capabilities to do the testing. Um, they typically don't take part in any of the treatment, so. Yeah, this is editorial, but it'd be interesting to know if those 500 people that hospice served, how many died of drinking dirty water, or dirty water. Anyway, uh, back to the source. The article says that it comes from the 185th. So has that been mitigated? Has that been shut off? Uh, they're going to keep polluting the water or what's going on? No, I believe at this time all of the uh, firefighting foams that contain PFAS have been stopped at the 185th. I, I don't, I'm certain, I'm not certain of that, but I've heard that they've stopped using that firefighting foam because of, for that reason. Yeah. No, I'm not being the 185th because it's a natural problem. It's, it is. You know, where they make this stuff, wherever that's at. Um, 
How about the the, the uh, underground fuel that's been down there since World War II? Uh, I was down at the Air Museum a while back, and the guy was telling me that uh, they don't know where that stuff is. Is that part of what's leaking into this uh, South Bridge? No. Uh, I don't know how accurate that is. They did a number of years of remediation at the uh, in that area for jet fuel. Uh, I do know that that remediation has has since been done with, and they've, they've plugged those wells based on the results that they received with no free product in the ground. Uh, so I'd have to look into that to further to see if any of that is accurate. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions I had for now. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to the regular consent agenda. Well, Thanks, the regular Brad. Agenda. The consent agenda is items 5 through 13B, consider them to pass unanimously. Unless the roll call votes asked for by a council member. If you want to speak on an item as I read it, please come up and state your name and address for the record. If you want to speak on an item not on the agenda, please come up under citizen concerns. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Five is a reading of the city council minutes of November 7, 2022. Six is a resolution approving the IDOT financial report for city streets. Seven is a resolution approving a home investment partnership program funding for 1711 Rebecca Street. Eight is a resolution authorizing the housing authority to receive five HUD VASH vouchers. Nine are items nine A and B are motions approving the annual reports of the Gillian Kosovo Sister City Committee and the Events Facility and Tourism Advisory Board. Ten are actions relating to agreements and contracts. A is a resolution approving a contract with Bainbury Constru Construction for the Alicia Avenue Paving Improvement Project. B is a resolution approving a contract to Brown Note Productions for the Tyson Event Center Fleet Farm Arena Audio System Renovation Project. 11 are actions authorizing payments. A is a resolution authorizing payment to T.R. Harris Construction for the Milwaukee Road Shops Historic District Railroad and Museum Trail Improvements Project. B is a resolution authorizing payment to Steve Harris Construction for the Big Sioux Highway 12 Trail Project. Items 11 C and D are resolutions approving partial settlements of tort claims and authorizing payments. <clears throat> B is a motion approving the payments for October. F is a resolution approving the fund transfers for October. 12 are actions relating to property. Items A, 12 to, to, to 12C are resolutions approving renewal options under lease agreements with Verde Outdoor Media for the Stockyards First Edition lots 3, 4, and 5. I have a question on that one. So do I. We just want to bring you up here. So this is no longer the, the same company, right? Uh, Jeff Hansen, Community Development Operations Manager. That is correct. It was formerly known as Avery Outdoor and is part of uh, the but They want to renew under the, the contract with Avery. But we gave them that right in the motion they, about three months ago. They provided an assignment of the ownership to the new company. And are they, are they maintaining the the signs, the property around the signs. There's been, around town, there's been a few signs that have kind of toppled over. And so is that something that, that's written into this agreement, that they're maintaining those or, or testing them structurally or making any modifications to them? Yes, there is a maintenance clause in the lease agreement. I'm aware of other complaints on other signs, but these three particular signs, we've received no complaints. We talked earlier. It bothers me when you do business with all, with all these signs that these guys have, and you have to find they haven't paid the rent. Now, and you have to what? You okay. have to find that they haven't paid the rent on signs. Because we had an agreement that because of the rebuild, because of, I get it. I mean, I know why we did it. But it's unacceptable that we would have to, well, it's unacceptable, number one, we don't have a system in place to know who the heck to build. That's unacceptable to me. And it's even more unacceptable that they know 
And that, that lease that they didn't pay the rent on was based upon what they got for rent when it reached a certain point. And we have no idea if they didn't get there early. We have no idea because they didn't tell us a thing about it. Well, that's, they always pride themselves on saying how they want to be partners. Well, be partners and pay your bills. And I'm not accepting that you, they just owe us two years at 2,400 bucks. I want to see the revenue on that sign. For lot three, yeah, because if they went over the twenty-seven thousand dollars in that time frame, they owe us some money. Correct. Well, they—I'm sure they're going to have a million reasons, but none of them are acceptable. They need to, and, I, and I, somehow, before you leave, because you—I've told you—you're the keeper of that. We got to figure out how we know going forward that we're getting the rent on all these signs around town. I'll work with uh, Randy and Finance, who keeps that list, and we'll provide a report. Thank you. D is a resolution inviting proposals for lease of the Riverside Recreational Sports Complex and scheduling a date for the receipt of the proposals. Anyone to be heard on this one while you're here? No? Matt, I, have, I do have a question for you on this. It says that the... Um, City Council is approving to invite proposals from parties interested in leasing the city-owned property to host outdoor youth sports, sport programs and tournaments. Proposal requirements should include the following. The first one jumped out at me uh, when I was doing my homework this weekend, the proposed per month rent. Isn't that going to be, is, is that where we're asking the parties to say what they're willing to pay per month? If they are willing to, Matt Salvatore, Parks and Recreation Director, if they are willing to pay rent, what that rent would be. How much weight does that carry, though, with all the other eight? We have nine, they have nine requirements that they have to provide information on. What weight does that carry? These requirements are not weighted at all. They're, this is totally at the discretion of the City Council. So... I mean, I'm trying to put myself in the position, Matt, of I would want to make some kind of a proposal, and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't, wouldn't even know what to do on the rent. I mean, and I don't There's want, good. you know, I guess I'm just looking for a guideline, but, but there, you're saying there isn't any. I mean, I don't know if it's $100 a month or if it would be $50 a month. Just to put everything in perspective, zero. no association outside of uh, Floyd Softball pays pays rent and then there's gets reconverted into capital improvement no association no association pays rent currently okay and that's my fear that's going to happen here you're going to have somebody will say i'll pay you five thousand dollars in rent and then they'll get a year down the road and they'll say well we're going to put it in the park and so therefore gosh we don't want to pay the rent anymore we'll pay it but we want it rebated right. back so i got that's a problem for me number two does it can a for-profit organization bid this? Because if they can, hear me out, we have never given utility money in that to anything but a non-profit little league type organization. We've never given it to a profit organization. So is that going to be a problem? Uh, we've never, we've never, we've only worked with non-profits and we're only aware of organizations that are non-profits that will be bidding on the potentially putting in a proposal for this. Well, I, I get that, but you're not limiting it. If we can't, I don't know that we can limit I'm it. I'm not saying you should. Yeah. But I think you have to be very clear that whether that weighs into give the decision or not. Or... Isn't that what we would take into consideration though, Mayor? That's what I was going to say. Is it no, one of the... For us? Let, let me ask this, Matt. Maybe it just tell me if I'm going too far on this, but so if none of the associations are paying any kind of rent, wh why don't we just take that off? I, the council's free to amend this however you see fit. That's completely fine. In the interest of transparency, it was originally presented without a rent component, and I asked that one be included. That could be removed by the council if they chose to do okay. that. Well, I don't want, I mean, I appreciate that, Nicole, and I, I want to follow your advice or if you think there's a really good reason for that. But, but honestly, when I read through this, it, it just threw me off. I, but if you're saying we're not putting any weight on it, but now I'm a little more and more concerned because if the mayor, if in his example, if somebody comes in and says, we'll pay you $5,000 and we don't have to give that any weight, I mean, 
it's going to put us in, I think it's going to put us in a, a difficult position. How do we sure. proceed with this? Sure. And this was kind of um, based on what we would do in an urban renewal area um, when we lease in a, in a TIF area. This is not included in that type of plan, but we felt that we still had to include some type of criteria for the council uh, to judge and make a decision. You can evaluate any or all of these um, based on the proposals that come in and determine how you want uh, to weight it. That is completely in the council's discretion. Um, but I these are just the factors that need to be evaluated. Okay. Can, I would like to remove that, the proposed rent. My concern would be that that would discourage some of the organizations from entering a bid if they weren't able to feel like they could offer anything for rent. And the note, there has been a notice that has been published related to this, I believe. It will be on Saturday. On Saturday, the notice will be published. So this would be the time um, to, pull it or to, to, to remove that as a factor if you do, do that. Does that notice have all nine of these bullet points in? It, from our it does. Uh, it's broken into two different categories, the quality of the proposed lease um, and then the economic feasibility of the proposed lease, which includes all the subcategories that are listen, listed in the RCA. Well, and I think there's a whole lot to go on here. I mean, they, and the other ones I think are pretty good. They're proposed annual program of activities to support full-time use of fields, the plan for concession management, a facility and athletic field maintenance plan, including winter management, a proposed CIP funding above and beyond the funding provided by the city, financial ability to perform program and facility field maintenance plan, a list of proposed staff, volunteer to be assigned to program management and facility maintenance, that's a good one. Establish a spirit of cooperation between user groups and the lessor, another excellent point. And the ability to secure liability insurance, naming the city of Sioux City as an additional insured. So all of those, I, I can, I, you, you can evaluate each of the proposals, but the first one I just would like to eliminate. Now, do I need to make a motion then to do that? Yes, you'd have to make a motion uh, to amend the proposed resolution and then attach notices. Was the reason for adding the bullet point one so that if there were some nonprofits or for profit agencies that were interested, they could show their interest by? Well, or even offering. nonprofit, if a nonprofit wanted to and said, this is what we would pay for rent, you know, and this is as long as. Because I'm guessing, Matt, when you say that any rent that was paid into it would be similar down to Chautauqua, be. Was, yeah. you would just reinvest it into the improvement of that entity? And, and my thinking and asking for it was like, for example, the long lines um, lease agreement that we have with the arena and the Hesse Foundation, there is a monthly rent component to that agreement mm -hmm. um, for use. How's that working out? Well, we've revised that a few times. <laughs> yeah to be towards improvements of the facility. Right. That wasn't the way, that's my problem, Alex. That's what I want to clarify. That wasn't the way that lease was written to start. We changed it after one year. And that's why I think we're saying now we are from the start. And so do we want, whether it's a proposed lease or like a rent in this case, going into the improvement of a city asset? But for the problem is you don't control any of that. I'm not, not speaking against any little league, but you guys don't really control any of that. We don't we don't we don't run the or the tice or the long lines repairs through city purchasing. We don't know what any of that really costs. Mm -hmm. So it, I don't I, I just take the rent out and give them whatever they get to run the complex. The rest of the little leagues get to run the complex and call it good as far as I'm concerned because it never works out like it's supposed to work out. It just doesn't. What do you mean? Read the lease that you had with the arena people to begin with on the long lines. Read that lease today. Now the, the payment that they were supposed to give us goes back into the building, which we have really no control over. I mean, you get a bill. I'm sure you get a bill for what they do. I get that part. But how do you know? And I'm not accusing them of anything because I don't have any idea. So don't take it that way. But unless city purchasing bid stuff, we don't know for sure what people are putting back into buildings. That's, that's my point. We don't. And it looks better down there and all that. But we were also promised meeting rooms and that. I don't know how they're coming on that. 
But that's all I'm saying. I just assumed it wasn't involved because you're going to go, people are going to bid it differently than a year from now when it changes. They're going to, there are going to be people that say, well, that's not the way we thought it was going to be. Just make it so it's what, it is what it is, and it'll be their job to maintain the fields to make sure that they're playable and those sort of things. You can put a minimum standard in there. I think you probably do that anyway with most mm -hmm. We do. And just leave it at that is all I'm saying. Well, I'm going to make a motion then under the proposal criteria that under economic feasibility of the proposed lease that number one, the proposed per month rent be taken out of the criteria. Second. Stricken. Go ahead, name and address, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Terry Kilberg, 1609 West 14th Street. Sorry, I'm a little nervous here, but um, I'm also on the board for Westside Little League. I've worked with the city over the last few years and Matt and their team with a lot of improvements at Westside. Um, you know, we, we obviously found out about this in the paper uh, with very short notice. And of course, I think we had some folks from Little League who reached out to a few board members to express interest. Um, I, I, I just wanna make sure that the council knows um, Westside Little League um, is interested in the SYA complex that happens to fall within our Little League boundaries. Um, we also um, are starting uh, this year, just so you know, Little League, we're celebrating our 50th year of Little League nice. and providing kids Little League baseball in Sioux City. Um, you know, and, and I think that should be celebrated. I mean, SYA is probably the nicest complex, you know, in, in, in the city. And so with them terminating their lease, essentially there's no softball right now, uh, softball program at that facility. Uh, we know we've heard uh, arenas interested in possibly doing some things, but I would, I would let, let you know, um, Westside Little League uh, has worked with a number of the other um, Little Leagues in town, headed Morningside. Uh, we're actually starting Little League softball at Westside Little League this year uh, with plans of utilizing Center Street Park, which was the old Northwest Little League um, that we had took over and made a number of repairs with. Um, we also are working with groups like the Old Timers Baseball Association, so they're actually playing baseball at Goldie Field to utilize those fields more. Uh, we're working with the Futures Organization, which is a, a travel organization, if you will, that provides baseball. Um, and they're planning um, to do a tournament at Westside Little League this summer uh, with 25 teams. Uh, it's June 3rd and 4th, I believe, Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I've been one of the, the, the gentlemen on our league to my kids play travel ball. We go to Des Moines, we go to Sioux Falls, we go to you know Council Bluffs. Fort Dodge, and I've always said, we need to do more things to, to bring ball here to Sioux City, right? So we're attempting to do that. I think the fields would be a great addition to Westside Little League. And when I say Westside Little League, we're not saying we want them just for our use. We want to be able to have, we've talked with Morningside Little League and Headed Little League and the other associations to have one facility. Bob, I think we've been at meetings before where we've talked about, right? There's not one facility that's, you know, that we have for, for, for the Little Leagues. So instead of giving it to Arena and letting them come in and put a bid in, that's gonna look far better than, than ours, right? We're not gonna be able to pay so much per month. There's not a single person on Westside Little League's board that gets paid. It's all volunteer. Every dollar we bring in from Little League registrations to sponsorships to grants goes directly back into the field. I think uh, we'd welcome any council member to come out and take a look at some of the things we've done from handicap accessibility, putting in new sidewalks, putting in lights, putting in scoreboards, putting in sprinkler systems. I think we've shown over the last few years that we take very good um, care of our park, mm -hmm. and I believe we do the same thing at SYA. And so I, I guess I have a question too. When you say in these requirements, full-time use of the field, what do you consider full-time use? Because we are, you know what I mean, with our seasons, what, what's considered full-time use? My definition would just be daily. Okay, because that's why over the last few years, <laughs> I mean, we live, a lot of us on the west side, you drive by, I mean, there's been weeks that go by and the fields were empty. They wouldn't even allow practice on them, nobody's using them. I mean, so it's, it's, it's not funny it's a requirement now, but it, nobody seemed to care about it before. <laughs> this thing's set empty for a while, it seemed like, you know. Um, well, and I, I would just caution you on that. I think that 
you know, the person that's run that and really established that I think did a great job and has kind of built a legacy there and was going through some health things. And, and I think now there's a situation where they understand and recognize that, you know, there can be more done out there. So they're going to be opening it up. But I think that's why there's, there's a great opportunity to do more, more programs out there than maybe they're capable of. So I would, I would just caution. Fair enough. I, I take that feedback. Appreciate Thanks. it. The other question I guess I would have for you is, and I'd have to look back because I didn't have time to do my research before I came today, but it was either a couple years ago when uh, Eric was still here. Mm -hmm. um, the city council voted to provide SYA with $50,000 that they were going to put towards a field at SYA. They came in and they took and removed a bunch of trees. There was talk about Healing maybe having a baseball field there. I guess my question is with SYA stepping out of their, their agreement, what happened to the $50,000? 25,000 of it was refunded and 25,000 of it was never paid. Okay, fair enough. I mean, there was just nothing in the paper. Somebody had told me, oh, it was, it was moved over to the, the turf field that they're using for healing baseball and stuff like that. And I, I just never, never recalled seeing anything in the paper or anything saying what happened to that money. So it's good to know that, I guess. Oh, we only do back. that for Morningside. We don't do it for Brothers. <laughs> we, um... <laughs> <laughs> To, Nothing like pitting. To an earlier point that you other. had, and I would, I would recommend this to anyone that's submitting a proposal, try to be as detailed as you can be sure. and as thorough as you can. Yeah, and then, and then my last point is just as a citizen and a taxpayer of Sioux City, right? Um, I have a hard time with our tax dollars for a facility that's city of Sioux City facility going to an organization that isn't really nonprofit. They may say they're going through a certain foundation, which is nonprofit, but let's... They, they, they pay people salaries, they're, they're looking to make money, they're looking to be profitable. Um, they're also competing with Little League in that sense. And again, we're celebrating 50 years. Why do we want more competition with Little Leagues that have done well for the last 50 years here? And I think Pullup provided a great place for kids to play baseball. And if Arena wants to focus on travel tournaments and bring people into the city, how about work with the Little Leagues? And they Nobody's said ever they approached would. us to say, hey, could we use your fields to play a tournament this weekend? I mean, if we had SYA as a facility with Westside Little League, there's no reason we couldn't work together to still host tournaments and things of that nature, right? And, and to be fair, I mean, in every conversation I've had on both sides of this right. issue, what I've heard is both organizations saying, whoever gets the contract, I hope that we would work together and Absolutely. really work to make sure that there is a lot of programming. I mean, again, I would just caution you. I, I understand that people say things out of context or do different things. But I would say, I mean, that the Hesse Foundation has provided a number of scholarships to different student athletes doing different things as well. You know, and so it would be run under the foundation, which is a nonprofit, not necessarily just the Arena Sports Academy. Right, and it, I mean, again, I, I respect you, Alex, but it sounds like you're defending them. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not, I didn't come up here and say the arena doesn't give anything back. They don't do this. They don't do that. No, I know. I mean, but you were saying that you, that you're, the Little League has done a lot of those different things and that the arena is just there as a profit that's going to throw money around. And I just was saying that I just wanted to also say that they have a nonprofit arm that has really given a lot back. That's all I was saying. Your, your, strength, your strength will be addressing what? Matt has put into this, and that's the spirit of cooperation. Exactly. Right. You, you talk about your strengths about that, right? And not not what others would have. I mean, just it's just yep. a suggestion on my part. But, Absolutely. No yeah. Problem. But talk it because you have a lot of strengths. I have, and, I have a lot of passion already, too, right? Well, I mean, it passion. may come out the and wrong so, way. Well, and his passion yeah. is that I think we yes. we volunteers have done really. We worked our butts off to try to provide a great place for kids to play baseball at a reasonable cost. Totally. And, and it shows in our kids how yeah, they're doing. And, it does. and there are places for travel teams and people that yeah. want that higher level of competition and want to be able to go out there. I'm glad the arena's here. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I see cards out there and people coming in every weekend. I just don't know why, why they need the, the baseball facility when we've, yeah. we've got plenty of things we can do and use and keep that facility full with Little League. Yeah, so thank you an guys. opportunity to expand and do more yeah. and collaborate, I agree. Absolutely. So, I wasn't trying to come across as defensive. I think you're doing a great job and, and you're advocating for your community and I, I think that that's great. So, right. no, I'm with you. Thanks for, thanks thank for your you. time. Thank you. Mayor, City Council. My name is Robert Bailey. Um, Terry's part of our, he's more on the, on the, on the boys' side of the, of the Little League. I have just been uh, selected as the vice president for uh, Westside Little League softball. 
Um, listen to what was just said right now. I, I think, and I'm just going to express my feelings on it. I'm not Sioux City born. I'm not from Iowa. I did 24 years in the military. Came here, uh, a friend of mine was a president, or a principal at our school, said, hey, we need help with that risk kids, something I've always done in my life. Um, throughout the seven, almost seven years now that I've been here, um, I don't have any children here. I recently, six years ago, took in a foster that lives with me. He's not a foster, he's mine. Um, but I've volunteered in the community with the softball programs, the baseball programs, um, I teach hitting. In a lot of cases, some of these families can't afford the price that some of these other organizations, I'm not gonna go into names, but they just can't afford it. So a lot of times what I'll do is just have them there, if you can be there. And I think for me, growing up in the Little League program, and in a 24 years of military service of going across the country, all over different places in the United States, for you that aren't aware or are aware when they talked about Title 10 and about how women's sports were put on the side, they didn't get the same that, that the men were getting. And you know, one thing that was brought up is 50 years of Westside Little League Baseball, right? That, that's a huge accomplishment. We're trying to start one year to get our young ladies in this community and it's not about, you know, I get it. We all have our rivals. Rivals. The mayor said, you know, the morning side, I get it. East, north, <laughs> healing, west. But what we're losing out on is if you look and if you follow any of the programs here in the city on the high school level, and I'll tell it to any one of their coaches, we're having one or two schools that make it maybe to the second round of the playoffs. Maybe one school that makes it to the state. What about the rest? And a lot of that has to do with our younger kids not getting that opportunity because, one, if they're on a travel ball team, some of these families just flat out can't afford it. So those kids aren't getting the training that they could get in a little league sitting. And, and for me, if we don't get it, I'm fine with it as long as an organization comes in and it provides. And I'm not talking about the star players. I'm talking about those players that are 13, 14, 15 on the bench. They're going to get the same practice time, have the same ability to go to fields and practice, improve their game. I mean, we're talking about kids that are going to start as young as six years old. And we have coaches out there that when they turn 10, 11, oh, you're never going to be good enough for high school. Really? Your body hasn't developed yet? Yeah. How many of us are still fighting mental trying to develop, let alone telling a kid that at that age? And at the end of the day, we just want an organization that's going to provide for these young ladies in this community to have a chance to play, to have a place to practice, because as it is right now, a majority of the time is once the season starts, there's very limited time to practice, limited spaces to practice. I can tell you cutting out, cutting the grass out of, at the church, uh, the Lutheran church on Riverside, going and talk to their pastor and say, hey, I'll cut your grass for free. Can I just use it to have practice? And they allow us. If we are having a chance to get the SYA or another organization comes in and having that ability, what does that do for our city? Like Terry said, our teams are going to Omaha. They're going to Des Moines. They're going to Fort Dodge. If you don't know, Fort Dodge is a staple. They're the top dogs around this area. Yeah. They run everything. And if we can start at a younger age and getting these kids the same amount of time, the same practice facilities and, and showing them what it looks like, having a chance to go to All-Stars and travel to another county, maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's three hours. That's a memory and a lifetime memory that those kids will have the rest of their lives. So I just want to be clear on that. We're not trying to attack anybody. We, yeah. at the end of the day, just want what's best for the young ladies of this community. And young man too, but since I'm the vice president of the softball, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick on the young ladies. Definitely. But thank you for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, we got a motion on the floor to to take the per month rent out. Call a roll, please. I see. Yeah, Matthew. Okay. Matthew. Thank you. Waters. Aye. Moore. Aye. O'Kane. Aye. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Thirteen are boards, commissions, and committee minute, minutes. That concludes the consent agenda. We can vote electronically. Is that working? Yeah, thank you. Passes 5-0-14. So hearing and resolution approving construction document for the Hamilton Boulevard resurfacing project. I'll move that. Second. Public hearings now open. Anyone want to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5-0, citizen concerns. Any citizen want to be heard, please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, please. 
Seeing none, we'll go to council concerns. Mr. O'Kane. I'm going to try and get through the list. Okay. Mm. So tomorrow at Design West is um, inclusion is a growth strategy at noon. Um, also tomorrow at the museum is current topics in the urban native community at 630. Um, Friday at the convention center, I won't be able to attend. Hopefully some of you will be able to make it. Um, Joe Thorn Thornton is speaking for Business for Breakfast at 8, 8 a.m., who is um, the head of Scooter's Coffee. So that'll be a, a great experience, especially in our hometown, who has plenty of scooters to offer, right? Coffee be served. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. That's a good stuff, right? Uh, speaking of coffee, also on Friday, um, coffee and purrs their opening day, they are opening around noon. That what was day? the first thing that I voted on when I joined council. So Who's that? Coffee and Purrs, cat the cat cafe. cafe. Oh yeah. What day though is it? That's uh, Friday, I believe, at noon. We can all celebrate. On one side you can pet cats, on the other side you can drink. It's separate, we should say it's separate. Yes, it is separate. I've seen those That's questions on Everything Facebook. I've got. That's it? Okay, Julie. Um, notable on the agenda today was one project over $2 million for Public Works. I just want to bring that to everyone's attention that these numbers have been published all year long, which means money, your tax dollars are being spent on those streets and roads and infrastructure like you're put the council to tax. I just want to ask the question, and as long as you brought that up, you bid a $2.8 million West 8th project and got zero bids. Why is that, gentlemen? On a job that size, we should know why the contractors weren't bidding. We should. I've heard two reasons, but I'm, you won't believe either one of them. But Gordon Fair, city engineer. Yes, uh, West 8th did uh, bid out two weeks ago tomorrow, I think it is, and um, need, nobody bid on it. Talked to a couple contractors. Uh, one of them said he just didn't get around to doing it, to bidding on it. Another one uh, didn't have the time for it because of his conflicts with his other existing projects. And another one uh, mentioned something about not enough time on the project. Not enough, time, not enough to time to do the job. The like window is too short. The yeah. guy that said that he didn't have, a, he just didn't get around or whatever to bid. It. Let me tell you what, on a 2.8 million, let's not kid ourselves. Right. He had no intention of bidding it. He can tell you that, but these guys all need work right now. So it's your completion date again. We've got to deal with that. We've got to extend it because we're not going to, you can't have a $2.8 million job and tell me there's not an interest on that because there is. They don't exactly like your consulting engineer and doing the inspection is one of the things I heard. I think you heard that, Dan, at lunch the other day, but that's beside the point. They can live with that. But we've got to figure out these completion dates so that you get bids. That project uh, has 120 working days, full six months of uh, work. So I. The one I did talk to that said he didn't have the time for it because of his other project, he said there was, there, that was enough time. In fact, uh, DOT wanted it shorter. Oh, no, that was another project. Sorry. That wasn't a DOT job. Nope, it wasn't. You're right. Well, okay, keep bending that way, and we're not getting Thanks, Gordon. Going, but okay, yeah. just bring him back. Alex, you <coughs> done, Julie? Done. Alex. Two things that I were, was, or a few things that I was going to bring up was um, tomorrow there is going to be a DOT public meeting about the viaduct. It's actually being held at the convention center from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. I, I tell you what, anyone that's in the audience, anyone that's listening, anyone that travels Gordon Drive, anyone that has a business interest um, in that type of a project, I really would encourage you to try to stop by that. It doesn't have to be, it's come and go throughout the entire five to seven period. The plans will be laid out. There's going to be a video playing, talking about um, the project and what's proposed. There are multiple options. 
And that's what I would just emphasize to everyone is that there are multiple options um, available of ways that we can go and different projects and different routes that we can have, even offshoots of it. Um, whether we build it exactly where it's at right now or it'd be off parallel to it, there are a lot of options and a lot of decisions to be weighed. And so I'm really looking for a lot of feedback from the public as well as any other interested parties um, to be able to share their right. share their thoughts Start and why. To weigh in. Exactly, because it's a couple hundred million dollars. I mean, it's a large project that's going to impact um, the future of our community for the next hundred years. So it's it's important to me and I'm sure the rest of the council that we get this decision right and we do what's best for the community. Just to add on to that, ultimately the design decision will be made by the DOT. This is a DOT funded project. Um, the city, they ask our opinions, things like that for direction, but we don't have the final decision on the design and start dates, things like that. So this is your time as well as a community to come in and give your two cents, give your opinion on the designs and talk to their staff about what you feel would be best for our community. For sure. And if you um, stop by that meeting and you're able to offer your two cents um, and your ideas for what you would wanna do, um, there, then you can also make another stop while you're downtown. Um, and especially Little League guys, I would put this on your radar. Um, if you're baseball or softball fans, um, there's a fundraiser for Wanna Have a Catch. It's the Miracle League Foundation. It's gonna be at the Orpheum tomorrow from about 5 p.m. and then at 7 p 7 7.30 p.m. Uh, they're gonna be playing Field of Dreams down at the Orpheum. It's kind of cool. One of the um, cast members from Field of Dreams is going to be there and is going to be playing catch with anyone that wants or anyone that signs up for that. There's gonna be a silent auction, all different kinds of stuff with the funds going towards the Miracle League um, for people with disabilities to be able to play baseball out there at that facility. So um, starts at 5 p.m., there's a silent auction. Um, I think there's some food and, and beverages, stuff like that, but then um, you can play catch with that, that cast member um, it just, it should be a great time. And who doesn't love Field of Dreams, especially, come on, we're in Iowa. You know, I think that there's a lot of nostalgia there, so it should be a really good event. So I'm gonna try to do both of those if at all possible, but hopefully can see some people at that fundraiser as what well. It should be a good time. The movie itself, I think, starts at 7.30. I it's the opposite of that. I thought Kevin told me the movie starts and then the I don't know. You better clarify that. I, I yeah. think it's the opposite. But the convention center with, uh, with the Gordon Dry Viaduct ends at 7, so Correct. that gives us time to get over there. And that's why it's come and go. So if yep. you can go to a little bit of the Gordon Drive meeting and then maybe be able to stop out and listen to the discussion and stuff like that, because I know there's going to be a Q&A with that actor. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, tomorrow, and that's my tomorrow night. And then um, there was one other thing. Yeah, we mentioned the business for breakfast. That should be great. All right, and that's all I had. Thanks, Mayor. That business for breakfast, I just want to piggyback onto that too. That's um, really uh, to help entrepreneurs get an idea of where you can start and where you can develop into. So that is an Omaha company. They started with, I think, one little kiosk, and I think everyone around here knows about Scooter's Coffee. So if you've got an idea or you're thinking of starting your own business or you're thinking about purchasing a business, that would be a great free seminar to go to. So I just wanted to add that in. Oh, I was going to say about that, though, that you need tickets for the Wanna Have a Catch thing, and you can get those online. You'll be able to get those online. And it sounds like the auction items are pretty impressive and and a great way to do that. But yes, because you said register. So yes, for Friday, register online, grab some tickets for Wanna Have a Catch, um, and hopefully we can see you all at those events. All right, Dan, I'm sorry. Up. Oh, yep, three minutes. I'll let you go a little long, but not much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, Couple of things, uh, last Friday, Veterans Day, the Mayor and the City Council did attend the Junior ROTC program at Girls Inc. It was absolutely fabulous mm -hmm. um, what our students are doing today. 
and being connected with the military. I also attended the longtime standing um, event at the Woodbury County Courthouse at 11 o'clock uh, that day, and that was also a very good program that they had to remember our veterans and to thank them for their service. So and you said you had some service time when you were up at the podium, so thank you for your service, but it was, but it was well attended. Uh, the next thing, and I, I hesitated to do this, but uh, I'm going to do it because uh, he's a good friend and he has been uh, a huge help to me, not only in the private practice, but being a city council member, and that's Jeff Hansen. And Jeff will be leaving us. Um, he's the community development operations manager. Uh, but I get a little emotional about it, Jeff, because I worked with your father, Jerry, for years when I was on planning and zoning. And I used to bring recommendations of planning and zoning to the council. So I've been on that side of the podium, ladies and gentlemen, and sometimes I prefer to be on that side, but, <laughs> but I've enjoyed my uh, time up here. But Jeff, it's, it's, you have served as a, you know your business so well when it comes to community development and planning and zoning items and board of adjustment items, but you've also have served as a mediator in a lot of situations where things could have blown up, but they didn't. And they remained calm and we, we got a compromise um, situation. Um, people shouldn't be afraid to compromise. They're not losing anything, but not everybody leaves the table full, but they don't leave the table hungry. And, and you have just been outstanding um, in your field and how you deal with the people, um, the whole staff, you know, you're all the, you're the voice of City Hall and you deal with the public day in and day out. And, and Jeff has been a superstar just as his dad was. It's just amazing. I thought, did, they, did your dad come home at night and just say, now this is what you want to do if you're ever <laughs> open for City Hall? <laughs> Because you've done a superb job, Jeff, and I just so tomorrow for the council and, and the city, we're we're honoring Jeff at a retirement gathering uh, tomorrow morning. I think it's at 9:30, 9:30 to 11:30. That's correct. Thank but, you very but, much. Well, thank you, and I'll miss you. Thank you, and I'll miss it as well. And I appreciate uh, all the support in the last 18 years that all of you have provided, as well as previous council members, staff, city manager. Uh, Marty Doherty, the department director. So again, I appreciate all your comments and hopefully I'll continue the opportunity to work with you on the other side of the podium, my new opportunity here in Sioux City. So again, thank you very much. I thank would you. echo what. 18 years. I would echo what Dan said. The only thing I would probably clarify differently is because I was on this side of the chair for both the Hansons. And I, went, I knew your dad when we were kids, so be sure and tell him that you were a much better guy than he, he was. I'll do that. <laughs> I will. Thank, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a great 18 years. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. On the ROTC thing, I would like to, because I think we need to help with this. I think that program is vitally important to our community, that we need to put the word out that they probably are looking at the two people that run that program retiring in the next couple years. Yes. And it's terribly important that we figure out, the school board figures out, but if anybody's interested in those jobs to run that program, uh, I guess they get like teacher's pay and other things, benefits and that, so it's probably not a terribly bad job. So hopefully we can get somebody to fill those two roles because the two that they have to have done a great job oh. of getting that program up and going. So with that, I move we adjourn. Second. Moore. Aye. O'Kane. Aye. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye.